Over on the community tab of the channel at the start of the week, I asked you all which of the serialized stories you wanted me to continue reading. Well, there was quite a selection there. We have the Pizza Delivery Diaries, the Breach Stories, uh, the President Space Force, the Dark Web Fixer, and then, of course, we had the overwhelming favorite for me to continue right now, which is this one about my organization taking care of everything paranormal. So, here we go with part three. Now we left off in the depths of the Siberian tundra, and that's exactly where we pick up in this episode. So, my dear friends, it's time once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, and listen. You know, sometimes I wonder who the bad guy is. Is it us, the invisible shepherds of the world, the paranormal police? Of course we aren't, right? Well, it depends on who you ask. If it's the local populations of where we're deployed, typically it's seen as an invasion of their country by a bunch of foreigners with scary weapons, trying to kill off their gods that have been worshipped since any of them can remember. To the nations in which we deploy to, we are an unfortunately necessary evil. A sort of last resort that costs too much and is too invasive, much like chemotherapy in cancer patients. Poisoning a person's body to save their life, however, is not how we see ourselves. Although some of us do hold the grandiose vision of heroes vanquishing ancient evils, the majority know that what we truly are and what we were created for. We are among the silent professionals that keep this world turning. We do our jobs without a second thought. Because, well, who else would? If we don't save these ignorant civilians from a bloodthirsty demon whom they worship and have been hypnotized by, who else will? Not the local government. Their solution is almost always insensitive and imprecise. And that is where we come in. A disposable, discerning asset that does the good work that others cannot do. As I phased in and out of consciousness on the back of that roaring engine, I thought of our place in the world and how we fit in. Who would remember me? Who would succeed me? We'd been moving through the forest for what seemed like ages, as fast as the snow bike would take us. The endless vibration and the constant up and down movement had made my rear end quite sore. <laughs> I'm sure Gabe was feeling the same. Or maybe it was just the fact we'd arrived at our destination. But Gabe released the accelerator, letting the snow machine grind slowly to a halt. The link track in the back screeching for the last few inches. The engine idled for a moment before dying completely. Gabe had flipped a small red switch to kill it. He stuck out his right thumb, gesturing off of the snowmobile. I slowly woke myself from the trance-like state I'd been in for the better part of an hour. Muscles stuck in their positions, mind filled with thoughts of the past, the future, and certainly not the present. I drew my left leg over the seat as I slid off, taking in my surroundings, which, thankfully, included a whole lot of nothing. Now. It was nearly time for the light to start building, as much as it could this close to the Arctic Circle. When you're this high up on the Earth, the constant storms tend to block out the sun. The wind had picked up again, but less violent this time. The snow had, for the most part, stopped falling. You'd still see a flurry occasionally, but what was on the ground was what was there to stay. The snow was a few feet deep in some places, with a large majority of the ground being flooded with snow. I stepped off of the snowmobile into a two-foot-deep snowbank, and it showed. Gabe had disembarked on the opposite side, and the difference in his height was amusing. However, I had little time to ogle him, because he moved on to the back of the machine immediately. I followed him kneeling down the best I could to untie my rifle from its rigging. As I pulled it from the now loose bindings, I looked down at my watch. It's a special kind, which I chose specifically for its shock-resistant design, its cool factor, and, well, its stealthiness. 
Casio makes them, and let me tell you, I find negative display watches beautiful and utilitarian. Problem is, the thing is impossible to see without light. I brought my left hand to my index finger on the other side of my rifle and pressed the illumination button on the watch a couple of times. The face began to glow a strangely comforting blue-green light and I was able to make out the digits that shone in the dark for a brief moment before the function shut off automatically. It was nearly 0800. Back at my home, in an undisclosed location, it would be night time. The fireflies might be out, dependent on the weather. A truly beautiful sight. Every time I look out over my ranch in the middle of nowhere, I get such a profound feeling of satisfaction, knowing that I wrought the fences with my own hands, used my own tractor to lay the roads, and my own money to buy the small, prefabricated house that sits in its centre. That is one thing that I refer to for inspiration. The knowledge that, if I complete my mission, I can return there and enjoy another few months of solitude. I certainly was thinking of it then. My mind snapped back to reality, and I pulled my pack off of the trailer. For once in the last few hours, I wasn't guessing as to Gabe's intentions. It would be stupid to charge straight into that village, especially considering what might be lying in wait turned out to be a really good decision, because as soon as we made it to the tree line a few kilometers farther, both of us simultaneously uttered a single, exasperated, fuck. The village glowed yellow, the whole damn thing. Covering every centimeter of it were hundreds of birds. Most lay dormant, but some pecked at the ground, as if they were trying to eat it. Gabe and I both slowly moved back from the tree line, instinctively ditching our rocks and taking cover behind a barren, fallen tree covered in snow. We sat there, our backs to the village, breathing heavily for a moment. I turned my head towards him, the tactical visor marking him as an ally, although I was well aware of that. After all, we had been through so much together, here and on our last mission together, that one went to shit quickly too. We really didn't get a chance to know each other then, and not now either. We always had to focus on the mission at hand. I decided to refrain from the obvious statement, oh, we are fucked, and focus instead on a solution. Well, I did state the obvious, just with a qualifier. Two, if we can't come up with a way to get that swarm out of there, we are fucked. At first, he didn't respond. I figured he was just thinking. But after a moment of silence, I asked him, Hey, Earth to Copperhead, want to? He sat there, incredulously. I slowly turned back to my sitting position, closing my eyes for a moment. My thoughts ran a set of checks to determine what exactly his reason for not responding was. Is he ignoring me? I thought. No, he would have turned away, or at least reacted. Especially with my second, rather cheeky remark. I opened my eyes again. I almost wished I hadn't, because in front of me sat something I wasn't really prepared for. My veins turned to ice, as the figure in front of me slowly rose, its slightly glowing skin emanating a comforting light blue hue, coloured, very similar in fact, the thick ice that covers Lake Baikal in the winter. She appeared almost translucent, but definitely physically present, also like ice. Yes, she. Her body was almost perfect in my eyes, as if it had been moulded specifically to what I enjoyed. Proportioned appropriately, Nothing outrageous going on around the chest area, but with a little bit more than you'd expect given the way the rest of her body looked. No magic mouse shawls and opaque yet invisible fabrics here, boys. No, oh, I could see it all. Her hair was long. It nearly reached down to her ankles, but it wasn't unkempt. It looked as if it had been very carefully manicured, styled and nurtured. 
She turned towards me as she rose, her legs straightening and her body reaching a standing position. It seemed as if that little twirl was a showcase, meant specifically for me. I breathed deeply as she took a step towards me, and she seemed to notice this as her step faltered. She left her foot halfway in the snow, not putting weight on it yet. Slowly, she leaned into it, more and more until it became another, and another. The snow crunched softly under her feet, until she was a mere metre away from me. And then, she stopped. She slowly laid down, facing me, never taking her eyes from mine. And even though they were concealed behind a mask, it felt as if she was looking right through it. She held her hand out and a small rock materialised in it. A moment later, she tossed it in a high, lazy trajectory towards me. I prepared for the worst to happen, for that rock to turn into some twisted ghost forest monster and burrow into me, into my soul. But before it even got halfway through its arc, it dematerialised. I realised what she was doing, baiting me closer. Perhaps she couldn't go any farther, or perhaps because it was, well, to toy with me. I moved to grab my rifle, but at this she immediately shrank away, looking terrified. I stopped, freezing my hand in mid-air, and with this she also froze. I slowly let my hand fall back to my side, and she watched for a moment before returning to her previous location. But this time, she did not lay down. She sat facing me. If I had to guess her age, I would almost certainly be factually incorrect, but she looked about twenty. I opened my mouth to speak to her, and she almost gasped. As if this was the last thing she expected from someone like me. I asked her, Do you govorish paruski? Or do you understand Russian? Her voice was high-pitched, but not so that it was unpleasant. Some would say sing-songy, but her voice was not exactly like this. She didn't seem as if she wanted to sing, but more like she rarely used her voice, like she detested using it. She responded to me quietly, eyes wide. Da! As soon as she spoke, the visor went haywire started marking her as a threat, then nothing, as if it was having a hard time deciding. Regardless of whether it would impede our conversation, I really didn't think then was the best time to figure out if I had epilepsy. I annoyedly ripped the helmet off my head, chugging it to the side. She seemed startled at this, but was not bothered as soon as she saw there was no threat to her. I spoke again, declaring in Russian, Speaking calmly and precisely. Well then, Ruzalka, you understand there is no chance in hell I'm going to let you drag me under the ice. The Ruzalka is a Slavic water spirit, with a western counterpart being something along the lines of a dryad or a nymph. She certainly looked like a Ruzalka. They are especially known for their long hair. She looked at me, almost insulted but also, in a way, understanding. Her lips parted, and spoke once more in her native language. We do not harm innocents, nor those who seek to do good in the world. The legends they tell of us are tainted with the blood and toil of Christ. This gave me pause. It was a common thing for Christians to do, when converting, to renounce their old religious or folk beliefs as evil. It had been a long time since I had encountered something that wasn't actually evil, however, something that had been truly twisted by religious converts and missionaries. I let the possibility into my mind, but simultaneously steeled myself, because where there's a legend, there surely is some truth. I glanced at Gabe, who still lay silent next to me. The Ruzalka noticed this and spoke to me in response. He slumbers by my hand. He was tired. When he wakes, he will be rested, 
and will be full of energy as a rabbit in the spring. So will you. The realization of what was happening slowly hit me, and she again rose up. Despite her earlier actions, she appeared to have no issue getting closer to me now. She spoke as she took a step closer. To us, humans are surrounded by an aura. This can keep us away, unless we are allowed closer. I stared at her, not really sure whether I'd deliberately allowed her closer before. She was standing in front of me now. She held my gaze as her body yet again coiled on the ground. Her eyes left mine and moved to my body, seemingly looking right through the many layers of synthetic fabrics that covered me. She reached out, gently placing her hand on my chest, and the instant she touched me, something happened beyond words. I can't describe it perfectly. Nothing could describe the beauty and horror of that moment. It was as if we entered each other's souls. I saw through the eyes of a young girl many years of neglect, culminating in an arranged marriage to a man she did not love. The night of their wedding, she walked off into the snow, where she was set upon by wolves. Alone, with no protection, her screams filled the air, but she was the only one that could hear them. She was running, wounded, through the forest. Her feet were bloody, long since having abandoned her shawl and shoes. As she ran, she looked for an escape, but found none. And suddenly, with a single step, she fell down, her body slamming into the ice. A strong undercurrent swept her under, and she was quickly consumed by the water, the deadly cold filling her lungs and starving her of all oxygen. They burned, but also froze at the same time. An indescribable mix of pain, along with the knowledge of impending doom. The next thing I saw was a familiar landscape. My childhood home in the southern United States. It sat on a small plot of land, just under two acres. The house was both hell and heaven for much of my life. The unassuming building held three bedrooms. One for me, one for my little sister, and one for my parents. The sky was dark, covered by dense clouds, themselves illuminated with the light of a thousand stars, clear in the sky, this far away from civilization. I was in my room, playing a heavily modded Battlefield 2 on my brand new gaming PC, a coveted piece among many at the time, with a brand new NVIDIA graphics card and 4-core Intel processor, all linked to a 720p HD display. However, I was getting frustrated. About that time, the game had been flooded with hackers due to a recently discovered exploit, and I refused to hack as a matter of principle, so I was left at a severe disadvantage. After the match ended, I quietly exited the game, took off my headset, and left it on the desk. It was about midnight on a Sunday, so it was about time for me to go to sleep anyways. The rest of the family already was. I stealthily opened my door and slowly crept through the hallway, moving my bare feet carefully so as not to make any noise. I took a left into the kitchen and slowly opened a cupboard to extract my favourite plastic cup. It was as I took my cup to the fridge to fill it with sweet cool water that a pulse of energy ran through my nervous system. Every hair on my 16-year-old body bristled up. I know this feeling now, as I knew it then. I was being watched. A multitude of thoughts ran through my mind, but I dismissed them as nothing. That is, until I looked out of the window. Out by the fence line, not far into the trees, a pair of red orbs stared into my soul. They were so far away, yet they pierced so far into my soul that I felt the distinct deathly tone of their scarlet glow. They flickered for a moment, and then shot out of the trees. They moved at an impossibly fast speed towards my home, and for a moment I was frozen where I stood, petrified. Time slowed momentarily, as it does with these things. A 
felt the familiar ice water flowing through my veins, and in my ears the only sound I could hear as I made a break for it down the hallway was the overwhelming bum 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 of my heart. All I wanted to do was scream. My lungs must have obliged, because as I reached the end of the hallway, the T-intersection where my parents' and sisters' door lay, my father busted out. Pump action, Vietnam, vintage Mossberg 500 at the ready. Down the hallway, I could hear glass shattering and metal screeching as a massive thing crashed through the glass and metal frame. Moments later, as I cowered like a calf behind my father, an echo from the shotgun blast slammed into my ears with the force of a semi. My eyes slammed shut, and again, the only thing I heard was the thumping of my heart which now sounded and felt more like it was slamming against the walls of my chest with every beat. For the second shot, my ears were covered, though this did nothing for my nose, which began to fill with the acrid smell of gun smoke and oil. And then I blacked out. The next thing I remember was running through the mesquite brush that surrounded our home, my skin bleeding all over from the sharp thorns of the mesquite and my bare feet cut from the rocks. My sister's hand was glued to mine, and as we ran in the dark, tripping over fallen branches and dodging cactus patches, the home we left behind was all but obliterated. We were found by a search party days later, hiding out under a large rock formation, having eaten the fruits of the pickly pear cactus to survive. The county sheriff was the first to speak, as he offered his hand to me, and his words still echo into my soul to this day. Son, are you going to keep running, or are you going to stand up, face your fears, and move on? I took it eagerly, and with my sister in tow, we followed him in the waning hours of daylight to the top of a hill. He called over the radio that we'd been found, and needed a helicopter extraction. We were both dehydrated and suffering from blood loss. I could feel nothing but a hollow sense of pride. We were alive. We made it. But even then, I knew somehow that we would never see our parents again. As the sun set, we heard the distant chop-chop of helicopter blades in the distance. A UH-60 Blackhawk, armed with two GAU-19A three-bowed 50 caliber rotary guns, passed high over us, doing a sweep of the area. And moments later, Another threw up a massive cloud of dust as it approached and came to a descending hover over our position. The sun's last light showed a menacing, yet somehow friendly saviour. That black painted titanium, aluminum and steel contraption as it lowered to the ground. A team of combat troops leaped out, establishing a circular perimeter in the cloud of dust that surrounded the helicopter. Out of its doors jumped a duo of two operatives, one was a young, springy guy, so tall that he nearly had to get on his hands and knees to avoid the rotor blades. His sleeves were rolled up, showcasing his muscular physique. He reached our position by the tree line as the medical crewman who had been examining us held out a thumbs up to him. He then bent over to me, yelling into my ear over the rotor wash. Ever been in a helicopter before? By now, I'd regained my composure enough to speak and I shouted into his ear, No, sir. He told me, sounding disappointed, Well, ain't that sad. Follow me, keep your heads down, and we can give you a nice, fun helicopter ride. I shouted again into his ear, oh, Yes, sir. And although my face didn't move, internally I was very excited. Helicopters were some of my favorite vehicles in Battlefield 2. My sister hadn't let go of my hand since that night, although I could tell she was less than excited about what was happening. She wasn't letting go. The man then turned to speak to the search party, telling them to return to the police station where they could all be debriefed. Above us, the second helicopter was circling, and apparently had spotted something, because the demeanour of the operative changed in an instant. The man who had spoken to me grabbed me and my sister and practically dragged us into the helicopter, through the rotor wash and the flying dust. I could hear it, 
far in the distance. It was crashing through the trees. It was coming. It would not let its quarry get away unscathed, as if it hadn't already done enough damage. However, the team was having none of it. From the doors I watched as they fell back quickly to the chopper, as the helicopter crew manned the guns. By now, the sun was almost gone. In its waning light, I turned my head up to look at the helicopter still in the air, just as what looked like a solid stream of 50 BMG tracer fire leapt from the side of the circling hello. The last of the team had evacuated to the helicopter, but the search party was far too large to fit. Maybe they would have to fit in the other heli. We tried to take as many as we could, and the others knew that if they didn't make it, they would likely die. After all, the huge thing crashing through the trees wouldn't be very happy with losing me and my sister. And then it arrived. In the trees, its eyes glowed a mad red color, almost too bright to look at. While the crew were arguing with the remaining people, the man who'd spoken to me noticed this. He yelled into the headset intercom that covered his ears, and the helicopter moved upward. The remaining people were still trying to grab on, but they had no chance, because all of the men who'd come aboard started kicking their fingers and ripping their hands off of the helicopter. Slowly, it started to rise. The man, now obvious to me, some sort of commander, was yelling something at the crew chief to no avail. He reached his breaking point, and through the noise seemed to scream, and punched the crewman manning the gun out of the way. He slid his hands onto the dual triggers of the beautiful GAU-19A, and after spinning up for a moment, it began spewing red tracers and hot lead downrange. Brass spilled out of the ejection port, which vented through a corrugated plastic pipe towards the ground. Rounds ripped through the ammo feed at a pace too fast for the eye to see, and with the firing of the gun, the helicopter began to rise again. The last thing I remember was the sound of the barrel spinning down, and later, through the red internal lights of the chopper, the dark silhouette of the man, telling me, My name is Robert Sullivan. I will take care of you, but I need one thing from you in return. You have to take control of your life, and above all, survive. As I drifted off into oblivion, these words echoed in my mind. So a very interesting part three there takes the story off into a wholly different direction from what we've had so far. Hope you enjoyed that one as much as the other parts. Well... I um, will be continuing the other serials that I uh, asked you about on the community tab. Six and a half thousand of you voted so far on those. And, uh, well, that was the number one choice, but all the others proved quite popular as well. So I will be getting on with the other serials in due time. But on Friday, I'll give you a little bit of something completely different. Sound good? I hope so. Well, see you again then. But until that time, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>